So uh, why don't we get going in the Word? Is that okay? Y'all yeah. want to study today? You want to preach, want to teach, see some people healed? Amen. Y'all want to see the kingdom of God this morning? Yeah. Well, then let's do that. So it is, uh, it's August 4th. It is 2013. We're going to start in Psalm 19 this morning. Say there when you were there. Our message is called Fish Don't Fly. Fish Don't Fly. Come on. Hallelujah. I some kind of love Jesus. If you don't love Jesus yet, you're going to before the service is over. What's in us is going to get on you. Don't let it scare you. We're just crazy, passionate, fanatical for Jesus. So in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice go out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Friends, you can't look around the creation that the creator has made and something inside you not long to touch him and be touched by him. When you just look at the beauty of what he has made, it's astounding. Jennifer and I were on a boat that was very large, but there were 4,500 people on it. With 4,500 people on the boat, we kept finding ourselves surrounded by folks that we didn't want to spend all of our time with. Can you understand that? They like to talk about things that we don't like to talk about. They like to do things we don't like to do. We were standing next to two men. They were in a family of 12, grown men. And they looked up on the balconies, and they saw a woman in a bathing suit. Well, that happens at the beach, right? People wear bathing suits. not big enough bathing suits. They're not as much material as I think there should be. But it is what was going on. And they began to shout things that lost men shout. It was kind of awkward. They had hoped to see even more of this woman than she was already displaying, and they were getting 90% of everything they wanted to see for free without asking. And I say, hey, fellas, fellas, be, be careful. You can't unsee some things, you know? And they said, oh, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, hey, man, what do, you, what do you do? I said, funny you should ask. I'm a pastor. <laughs> Both eyes straight to the ground. You know, we reduced men who were six foot four and 350 pounds to little boys in a second just by knowing that someone who represented Jesus was near them. So we end up at a dining table, and, you know, we didn't get to pick our dining table. Somebody else picked the dining table. And guess who is just in the distance, about as far away as Alex, and, uh, and he's, he's telling a story. He says, hey, y'all, y'all won't believe this expletive. I was standing in line, and I was expletive, expletive, expletive calling out to this woman, and man, there was an expletive, expletive, expletive pastor in line. Can y'all believe that? I'm like, hey, 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 friend, still here. <laughs> By the way, still here. <laughs> oh, isn't it fun to be in Jesus? Every once in a while, though, we just wanted to sneak away. And when we snuck away, we found a, a little spot overlooking the water. And I saw the neatest thing. The underwater world is a dangerous place, whether it's a river, a lake, or an ocean. Most dangerous of all is the open sea, because when predators strike here, there is nowhere to hide. For most fish, that is. of the water, flying fish soar on long fins adapted for airborne escape.
but escaping predators is only half the battle. They also have to make sure there's a next generation. Fish don't fly, at least not normal fish. But there are some. They want to escape the predators beneath. They want to escape that environment so badly that they do something entirely unnatural. It is almost supernatural for them. It's beyond the natural order of what fish do. They found a way to rise above the fray beneath. Come on, church, we could learn something even from the fish. This morning a man gave me a prophecy. He said, this is a benchmark in this church. Today we turn a corner where some of the frustration, some of the contention falls off, a clarity of vision lies ahead of us, and we will reach our goal. In the name of Jesus, I receive that word. Because sometimes we're just going to rise up, friends. Now, you can have a balloon sitting on the ground, but until you fill it with air, it's not going anywhere. So long the church has had all of the right structure. The church has had all of the right window dressing. But what we need is to be filled with the Spirit of God. How many of you are still in Psalm 19? All right, y'all can speak out loud. Even you white folks can speak out loud in church. Lightning won't strike. If you got some pigment in your skin, show your neighbor how to do it. It's okay. This is not a white church. It's not a black church. It's the church of Jesus Christ. And you know what? The church of Jesus Christ... It knows how to say amen. It knows how to express itself. It does not believe that sitting in complete silence will get anything done for the kingdom of God. So somebody say, I love you, Jesus. All right, we were in Psalm 19, and now we're going to go one chapter to the right in your Bible. This would be Psalm 20. In Psalm 20, in verse 6, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and we stand firm. Friends, some people will never overcome the circumstances that are around them. There will be negative talk about them and they become a part of it. There will be negative actions towards them and they become defeated by it. But those that have been born from above learn how with the saving power of God's right hand to rise above that stuff, to get beyond that stuff. In the name of Jesus, we cannot live ordinary lives. He called us to soar. He did not call us to be sore. In the name of Jesus, the church of the living God is going to learn to rise up. Turn with me to Isaiah 40. Say there when you were there. I'm going to tell you those little fish, sometimes one will catch the wind just right, move by the spirit just right, and those little jokers will go 40 or 50 feet. It's, we spent hours just seeing how far they would go. And you can tell when something big is lurking under the water because 30 or 40 of them, they get out all at once. <laughs> Guys, it's not cowardice to get out of the fight. It's not, not at all. We do not wage war as the world does. We have weapons of righteousness in our right hand and in our left. We're simply calling in the air attack. We're simply calling on the power that is above us. And we're choosing to walk in his presence rather than in their scum. It could be a hurtful thing to say their scum. But we need to learn to identify what is right from what is wrong. And we're in a generation that is celebrating everything that's wrong. I watch people with Christian t-shirts on laugh and applaud as people make jokes about homosexuality. I watch the same folks entertained by comedians whose entire act were sexual innuendo. Not only have they not risen above those things, they've been entangled by them. Church, we're at war. And our enemy is subtle. I find one of the cures for being subtle is to not be subtle. Be bold. Be blunt. Be upfront. Let the world know where you stand. Draw the line in the sand and let everyone know who you are and what you've been born of. It's an amazing thing. 
Darkness is scared of light. It is. It doesn't want the confrontation. It doesn't want it at all. It would rather stand with other darkness and speak about the light, but it does not want to be dragged next to it. As soon as those men at the dining table found out that Jennifer and I were sitting within earshot, you know what they did? They shut up immediately. Twice, two grown men, both that made me look like a little man, were completely silenced and reduced to children solely because somebody who loved the Lord was next to them. Imagine what would happen if they got the revelation that God's eye is on them always. Are you in Psalm 40? No, Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, let us look at verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Have you ever been in a situation where you feel completely left out to dry? You just feel hung out there, rode hard, put up wet, and now you don't have anything left to do but complain. Now, I'm asking you if you've ever been in that situation, but I'm your pastor. I know you. Some of you have lived in that location way too long. When we get into a place where we think God is not aware of our situation or He doesn't care, you have been entangled by your situation. You're knee-deep in the muck, and you need to find the rock that is higher than I. So often, a Christian is not defeated by the manifestation of a demon. So often, not defeated by some satanic warrior. They're defeated simply by unfavorable circumstances that they don't believe they can change by prayer. Most of these books of the Bible were written by men who lived in deserts, who were destitute, who had no place to lay their head and no place to call home. And you know what? They learned to rise above those circumstances. In fact... Because they loved the Lord, their circumstances magnified the Lord. The best thing that could happen to this nation is that we lose some affluence and have some affliction. If that scares you, I'm sorry. It's the very best thing that could happen because then we'll find out who really loves the Lord and who was just playing at the party. In the 40th chapter, picking back up in the 28th verse, do you not know, have you not heard The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the heavens and of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and of his understanding no one can fathom. We have not worn out the Lord with our discussion with him. It does not make him tired. Ladies, I know you feel like you need to get everything that happened in your husband's day from him in the last five minutes before he falls asleep at night. He may fall asleep while you're talking to him. It happens. In the name of Jesus, I'm sorry, Jennifer. (laughs) Public repentance is a good thing. It's safe all the way around. Nobody hurts you when you do it in public. Sometimes we need to learn to take it to the throne. Christians, we can stay away from the phone. We can stay away from Facebook. We can take it straight to the throne. When you begin to tell him, he doesn't get tired of listening to you. He doesn't get tired of encouraging you. He doesn't get tired of filling you with his presence so that you can rise above the circumstance. He doesn't. He hates grumbling, but he loves prayer. The difference is grumbling is what you're telling everybody else about what he won't do for you. And prayer is your honest conversation with him. It's okay to say, Lord, I'm scared. It's okay to say, Lord, I don't see any way out. But before you're done praying, something will happen in you. You'll learn to say, but I trust you, Lord, and I'm confident that it's on the way. Come on. John 10 teaches us something. It says that the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to what? The thief comes with a threefold purpose, to kill, to steal, and destroy. How many of you are still here? Come on, if you're not here, where are you? Then, the, then he's failing. He may, have, he may have tried to destroy you, but he didn't, he didn't do it. He may have tried to kill you, but you're still here. At best, he's stolen a little bit from you. What reason do we have to think that God will abandon us in this year of our life when he hasn't in every other year? Come on, the Lord's been on you since you walked through the doors of this church and probably a long time before that, but that's when I noticed it. Yeah? Something's been happening in your heart, hadn't it? Yes. It began to show up in her life, I could tell. I don't even remember your name, but heaven does. What's your name, sweetheart? Tamara. Damara. Even better. Damara. 
Damara's got something going on in her life that you can see through the windows to her soul, her eyes. Guys, if you are willing, if you are willing, the Lord will deliver you from anything. You know what he won't do? He will not make you love him. He will not make you honor him with your actions. He will not make you do those things. He is the ultimate. If you want him, you have to learn to chase after him. And you know where he's not? He's not down in all of that. In Louisiana, they call it boo-boo D. Stinky mud. He's not down in all that boo-boo D. If you don't understand that, Brother Charlie will explain it to you after the service. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and of his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Why do we fight to appear strong when the Lord our God gives power to those who know they are weak? Come on, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 say, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. When we understand what we don't have, we begin to understand what we need. Oh, now, friends, this would be hard. But with your mouth, you make confession. That's how that works. And out of the abundance of a man's heart, his mouth speaks. And when we learn to make the right confession, sometimes... It commits us to a position God can bless. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't need money. It won't solve my problems. <laughs> oh, come on. Did you choke on that? You ought to say it again. I don't need money. It won't solve my problems. I simply need what the Lord has for me. If you are convinced that $100 would change your life, that $1,000 would change your life, or that $100 million would change your life for the better, look at the history of the lottery. It is not true. It has never been true. And those who are wealthy in this world often find it very hard to enter into life in the world that is to come. Money will not solve your problems. An infilling, continuous overflowing of the Holy Ghost will solve your problems. I wish that what the church was saying was true. What they're saying is that God is interested and helping you in this life and giving you heaven in the next. That you'll have your best life now. And by best life, they mean prosperity as the world defines it. They begin to teach us that if God is really blessing us, the way that it'll happen is everyone will see your material wealth and they'll want the Lord. I don't know what a proper way to say it. Let's say rubbish. How about that? Garbage, basura, whatever, however you can express it and we can get it from my heart to yours. What a giant load of boo-boo D, stinky mud. The truth is, is that the living God will put you in the worst circumstances on the planet and cause you to prosper and that you survive, that you are happy, that you are filled with his power and that all of the power of hell cannot overcome you and this makes you a bright shining light in a very dark world. The sign that God's hand is with you is the enduring power of the faith and patient perseverance of the saints. That is the sign that God is with you. Guys, we don't need an easy way out. You know what we need? We need to learn to lift our face upward. We need to learn to say, Lord, I don't have all the strength I need, and I heard that you're the kind of God who will give strength to the weary and power to the weak. Would you give me a power up right now? You know that there were times Jesus was a little pressed. He sweat as if it were drops of blood. He actually said, Lord, if there's some other way. And you know what happened? He was strengthened from on high. Heaven sent its angels to attend to him. There is nothing wrong with admitting where you are. It might be the smartest thing you've ever done. There's something wrong with staying where you are. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Come on, getting filled with the Holy Ghost in 1993 was not enough. Being filled in 1994, not enough. We need our strength renewed. The only thing better than new, friends, is to be renewed. You can do this again and again and again and again and again. 
Come on now, how many of you like water? You think you don't like water until you've been without it a little while. Who was in Honduras? Raise your hands if you're in Honduras with me. Oh my goodness, water became very precious very quick. You didn't even mind drinking it if you had to drink it from a stream or from a, a runoff of a roof. When you haven't had it in a while, you are thirsty for it. That we could learn to be thirsty for the righteousness that comes with His Spirit. You drink water all day, every day. In a survival situation, you might drink more than three liters of water in a day. Church, if we could learn to drink of Jesus daily, all day, every day, because your life depends on it. If you're in the Mojave Desert, do you want just 16 ounces of water? Depends on how long you're there. If it's your home, you need lots of water every day. Come on, the environment around us is sapping to our spiritual strength. It is. There is what the Bible calls a flood of dissipation all around us. The pollution of this world. And I don't mean what comes out of a car. Al Gore once said that the biggest threat to our, our, our society, our globe, was the combustion engine. With all due respect, Al Gore is an idiot. The biggest threat, the single biggest threat to civilization as you know it is sin. And it is abounding and increasing all around us. And only those who are filled with the power from on high will find themselves free from sin. In John 8, 31, Jesus said to disciples who already, to the Jews who already believed in him, if you continue in my teaching, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It was never enough simply to know the teaching of Jesus. It had to be continued in daily. You needed it as much as you need water, and it cannot be intellect only. It's fantastic if you're interested in the things we have to say, but it is a whole lot better if somewhere deep inside you there is a dry sponge that is being filled from the throne room of heaven. Do you want the heavenly water? Yes. Jesus promised it to us. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. Come on, it's not natural for men to fly, is it? It's no more natural for a human being to take flight than it is that fish to take flight. But some of us have learned to do it. We have learned to be filled with the Spirit of God to the place where we are simply not encumbered by all of the stinky mud that is around us. We have been snatched from the hand of God and brought to a place that is the firm ground of Jesus Christ. You know, it's amazing the things that happen. You come back to a worship service and your son breaks out with asthma. So what are you going to do? You begin to fear. It'd be a normal thing. He's my son. I love him very much. I've had to drive him to the hospital before. Every day has not been victory in our lives. The victory is that you wake up every day and you continue to fight. I've seen him turn blue, and I've considered harming someone who would not admit him into the hospital quickly enough. Now, there are no daddies out there, huh? They say that the only thing more, that there's nothing more dangerous than a female bear protecting her young, well, I'd, I, I, I would challenge that. Let one of your children not breathe, and it don't matter whether you're male or female, and you do whatever it takes to get them air. What if you needed the presence of God like that? Because your daddy wants you to have it. He wants you to have it. He wants you to have it. He wants you to have it enough that he shed his son's blood just to clean up your house enough to let his presence into it. Boy, that's a, that's, that's a mouthful if you think about it. Well, I may not be preaching well. Good thing it doesn't depend on me. But let us just think about that for a minute. The point of the cross of Calvary was to put you in right standing with God so that he could fill you with his divine presence that would enable you to keep his will. That's the point. The cross without the baptism and the Holy Ghost is like cleaning your house and not living in it. You need the Holy Ghost. 
You need it to the point that men that walked with him three and a half years were told you wait in Jerusalem until you get this. They weren't allowed to leave and go start the churches that have first this, that, or another on it. They had to wait there until his spirit became everything to them. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, Acts 1.8 says you will receive power. Dynamite, dunamos, power. Power that you do not get weary when everyone else quits. You do not faint when everybody else falls out. He will give you the kind of patient endurance that is characterized by the church in the book of Revelation. He says, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints. This is because you are put in situations that everyone else grows cold, but those filled with the Spirit of God could never deny the love that they have for the Lord. That doesn't come from a human heart. It comes from something like what David cried for. Create in me a clean heart. Renew unto me a steadfast spirit. Give me the joy of my salvation. When what is born in you was born of the heavens, it's not a doctrine taught by men. It's not simply a magic phrase you learned at an altar. It could not be conquered by all the power of hell. That's how you know you've been born of God. And I'm not scared to be put to the test. And I pray in the name of Jesus that Holy Ghost courage rise up in you to not be scared to be put to the test because what is in us is genuine. The way you find out if something's genuine is you put the fire to it. Come on now. Church, we were born. We were born for a time just like this. Everybody can whine about the economy and I'm getting a smile on my face because the God I serve is able to keep me alive even in famine. It's one good way to know who belongs to the Lord, isn't it? Do you want to soar? Do you want to soar? Are you, are you satisfied with bottom dwelling? You know who in the Bible were bottom dwellers? Oh, my goodness. Turn with me to Exodus 17. Is it okay if we don't have a neat little script for a sermon today? No three points in a poem? I never learned to do that. You know, the number one thing that I get from people when not on a cruise ship, and I tell them I'm a pastor, Brother Richard, I think you said this to me too. You're a pastor? There's a certain question in it. It's like it's hard for people to believe. This is because we've set up an image. And this image has to be just so. And it's been so popularized that it's what we think of as a pastor. You know what a pastor really is? He's a brother in the body of Christ that may or may not have a slightly different function than you do. That's all it is. We need to get out of this idea that we hire a holy man on a holy day to teach us holy things for a holy fee. It is holy garbage. It's not true. It's not true. You know what we are? We are the living, breathing body of Christ. Each member indispensable, each one worthy of the honor of Christ because he lives and dwells in you. I need my brothers and my brothers need me. Y'all want to hear about valley dwellers? In Exodus 17, look at verse 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. That's a, <laughs> Amalek, the Amalekites. The Amalekites in Exodus 17, their name means warlike valley dwellers. You may never have met an Amalekite descendant from Amalek by blood, but I promise you've met them spiritually all of your life. These are the guys that have never soared. They've never been on the mountaintop, and they don't want you to get there either. Every time you talk to them, they're telling you how bad life is. Instead of putting their face in his book, they're posting on Facebook every morning, oh, the day's bad, and it's 8.32. They hadn't had enough of the day to call it bad. They decided it was bad before it started. By the way, if you're in this church and you love me enough to listen to me, do not post that garbage on your Facebook. We don't want to hear how terrible your day is before noon. We don't want to hear it. You know why we don't want to hear it? It's sin. Stop it. Just don't do it. If you wouldn't paint it with a brush on your house, then do not post it for the whole world to see how miserably defeated you are. 
Instead, post something else. Post, I am struggling, but in the name of Jesus, he is meeting my need. Post something that inspires faith in the name of Jesus. And let's get out of the muck. Let's get out of that stinky mud because the Lord is calling us higher. If you believe you have a Facebook ministry, let's just clear that up. Any Christian is a full-time minister. Everywhere we go, we are eating, breathing, living the Word of God. We are living epistles for the world to see. We were not called to hide in our houses in post cute bumper sticker-like sayings half of the time and the other half of the time whine and complain about the world around us. That is not ministry. Amen. What is ministry is looking at people who are struggling and telling them that the Lord can help you if you're willing. Brother Jay was preaching the other day and he mentioned it out of Isaiah, Isaiah 1, 18 or 19. said, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. He said, it is not enough to simply be a king's kid. The king's kid don't eat the best of the land. King's children who are willing and obedient, they are the ones that eat the best of the land. It is not enough to simply say you were born again. You need to be born again, filled with the Spirit of God, and staying in step with His Spirit. That is where we find all of our strength, all of our power, and all of our joy. Back to Exodus 17. The Amalekites, warlike valley dwellers, came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Do you know what Rephidim means in Hebrew? Rest. It's always at what the devil thinks is an opportune time. You set down your sword. You're not as vigilant. Maybe today you decided that what you really needed was an hour of entertainment instead of an hour of prayer. These are the opportune times that the devil finds in our lives. Friends, if an hour of prayer is work to us, it's an indication that we are not as full of the Spirit as we can be. An hour of prayer ought to be a joy to us. It ought to be something that we look forward to, like I look forward to spending an hour with my wife. Do y'all believe that I love Jennifer? Those of you that have known us for a while, just stand up, Jennifer. Do you believe? Stand up. In the name of Jesus, stand up. I can repent Wednesday. Y'all believe that I love her? Can you see that? We wear a sign. Don't sit down. We wear a sign of the covenant. We wear it everywhere we go. That's a sign. But that's not the only sign. We're happy to be in each other's presence. We enjoy talking. And if we're estranged very long, we long for each other. That's how our relationship with the Lord is supposed to be. Your love for Jesus should be no less obvious than your love for your spouse. You know, Steve and Dee Dee love each other. They love each other. They're like teenagers. They walk around. They, they don't go very... Look, they're holding hands right now. Come on, if you're married in this church, you can hold hands. It's okay. Go ahead. You can reach over, stretch out a little public display of affection and holding hands. There's not a thing wrong with it. It might tell the world that there's still hope for them. Not every marriage ends in divorce, friends. Not every covenant is destined to fail. One man can love one woman all the days of his life and be better for it in the name of Jesus. Amen, Charlie? The warlike valley dwellers are the naysayers of the world. They attacked the people of God while they were at rest. Moses said to Joshua, this is Joshua's first mentioned in the canon of Scripture. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. I want you to understand that the reason Joshua appeared in the canon of Scripture was to choose special men to go out and do war with the warlike valley dwellers. God is not into oppression. God is into the release of the oppressed. He's in to, to setting captives free. And so he finds people and he chooses them specially. Joshua is that word that means salvation from which we get Jesus. Hoshea, Yeshua, and Jesus. All of these words mean the same thing. Jesus appeared to destroy the devil's work. 1 John 3, 8 says that. Joshua appears in the canon of Scripture to do war with the Amalekites. And what is God's battle plan? He puts Moses up on a mountain. And Joshua down in the valley. Where are the people of God? They're in the valley. 
They are down there fighting, but that's not where their eyes are at. They're looking up at Moses, the standard of God. Come on, you're holding his righteous standard in your laps. Hold up your Bible and say, this is the standard for my life. Do you actually believe that? Then no matter what it says, it is the standard for your life, whether you find it dignified or not, whether you find it business-like or not, whether you think decent people ought to do it in church or not. So when something like Corinthians 14, 26 shows up and tells us these things must be done for the strengthening and edification of the, Bible, or of the body, speaking of the spiritual gifts, you don't have the right to change the standard. Did y'all hear? We had a prophecy in tongues. That would scare some people right out of the church. Do you have the right to tell God that we should not have what His Scripture says we must have? I love it. We're going to have a special service at such and such time where we will let the Holy Ghost move. Like, like He works for you instead of you for Him. Like He needs to be filled with you instead of you need to be filled with Him. Guys, there is a war going on all around us and we need to get filled up. God put Moses up on the mountain. And what did He do? He raised His arms. Could He do it alone? No one man's going to hold up the righteous standard of God, not in this ministry or not in any other. God works in covenant. So they stationed Aaron and Hur. Those names mean praise and nobility. On his left and on his right, and they helped hold up his arms. And as long as his arms were up, Joshua and the chosen men were winning in the valley. Oh, come on. This is a picture of what should be on your face. Do your, does your face declare the, the praises of God? Do the corners of your mouth point at the heavens or do they point at hell? Sometimes a smile is a statement of faith, friends. When all is going wrong around you, don't go with it. When all is going wrong around you, rise above it. Let's look at the heavens and say, you know what? Nothing on this earth is going to determine my destiny. In the name of Jesus Christ, I will rise to the heavenly calling that he has given me. Yeah. Whenever Moses' arms dropped, the people began to lose. You know what your barometer is? God put it in a place you can see it every time you look in the mirror. Where is your joy? How did Paul know something was wrong in the Galatian church? He said, what happened to your joy? Who cut in on you? You were running such a good race. What did God say to Cain? First thing he says, why is your face so downcast? Christians ought not look like the most miserable people on the planet. That is impossible to be filled with the Holy Ghost in His power and be depressed and sad all of the time. In the name of Jesus, we can admit that we're feeling depressed. We can admit that we're feeling sad. And then you ask Him to change it and believe that He does. And we rise above that. My emotions will not master me. God gave them to me to serve His purposes. You feel compassion and so you do compassionate things. You feel anger. And if it's the same kind of anger God has in a situation, then you do what is required. It's okay to get angry sometimes. In fact, I think the church is not nearly angry enough. Oh, that surprises some of you, huh? You ever read what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus? He said, you hate those who practice such and such. He said, you hate it. You ever read uh, Romans 12? Romans 12 teaches us to abhor what is evil. We are supposed to hate certain things. We're supposed to be angered by certain things. The psalmist said, I was angry with those who were angry with you. Our emotions are here to, to enable us and help us serve God. Don't let them become your master. If you woke up this morning and you decided it was going to be a bad day because you felt bad, then you need to learn to say, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let your spirit command your emotions how you're going to live this day out. I got the same flesh you got. I may got more of it than you do. And it lies to me. It would like me to do what it would like me to do. But I will not be ruled by the flesh because I'm taught that those who are ruled by the flesh inherit death. Yeah. To be carnally minded is death. To be led by the Spirit is life. What do you want to be led by, church? The Spirit of God. 
The first mention in all the Bible of Joshua, he shows up to do battle with those who are intent on being warlike valley dwellers. Did they win the battle? They did, saints. And they won it by keeping their eyes on the standard of God and doing what they were called to do. This is the same way we win the battle. I wish you could win it at an altar. You can't. At the best thing that can happen in altars, you can get pushed off of high center. The battle is tomorrow. It's not in here. This is the huddle. We practice in here and we perform out there. Turn with me to Psalm 8. In Psalm 8, we find out where God set His glory and where our eyes should be. Are y'all still with me this morning? You know, the church today has about a month-long promise and about an hour-long commitment. And it's a real problem because we're convinced that simply saying a thing makes it so and that there's no need to do it and that if God wants it done, He'll do it Himself. And uh, sitting back crossing your arms and saying, if God wants me to be filled with the Holy Ghost, He'll fill me with the Holy Ghost. Salvation doesn't work that way unless you're Presbyterian and then it, it might work that way for you. But for the rest of us, we believe that salvation happens when you stretch out in faith. And when you stretch out in faith, He credits you with righteousness. No frozen chosen in here. Nobody that was forced to be saved or cannot be saved simply because a theologian in the 14th or 15th century said so. In the name of Jesus, if salvation works as you stretch out in faith, why would you think the gifts work any other way? They work as you stretch out in faith. How many of you want to prophesy? See, every hand in the building should jump up immediately. Do you know why? Because the Bible tells us to desire prophecy. Tells us to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. We're not told this. We're told to desire what Donald Trump has and it'll be a witness to the world. And it is a lie. What he has is something that has become idolatrous and enslaved him. It's enslaved him to the point that he trades in his wives every few years because he cannot find happiness in all of his wealth. But the church is convinced that wealth is what we need. My friends in India taught me that the rich count their money and the poor give it away. The real work of God around the world is supported by those who have the least to give and give the most. That expression of the widow's might is showing trust. When a wealthy guy gives the same thing, he's tipping God. And he thinks he's done a service. He actually gives the waiter who brought him the filet mignon and the lobster more than he gives God. And he thinks he's doing well. The foul-mouthed comedian that everybody listened to, he had a 501c3. He gives away cowboy hats to children with cancer. Y'all can all go, oh. I know, we're all supposed to love it. He gives cowboy hats to kids with cancer. Noble cause. It's a humanitarian effort. Those kids... They'll get a cowboy hat. That's what they'll get out of it. From a man who is a purveyor of filth, they'll get a cowboy hat. But let any person, the most feeble in this room, get filled with the Holy Ghost, and you have the power to teach that child about a heavenly eternity, a heavenly destiny. You may even rid his body of cancer. And if you like, you can give him the cowboy hat too. These people are all doing things that the church should be doing because they feel like if they sprinkle a little bit of righteousness in all of their filthiness, that it will make it clean. It doesn't work that way, friends. It never has. God's not interested in being tipped. He wants your entire life. Say, I'm going to give him my whole life. Come on, say it again. I'm going to give him my whole life. Now, some of you don't know me that well. I'm actually going to hold you to that. You said you're going to give me your whole life. You said it twice. Everything's been established by two or more witnesses. I'm going to hold you to that. And I want you to hold me to it. And when you see something that's inconsistent with it, love us enough to say so. I don't know who taught first that Christianity was a private matter, but it's a lie. By the way, do you know who said, hate the sinner and love the sin? Can anybody find that scripture? You know why? Gandhi said it, but it's quoted from pulpits all of the time. I want to tell you the truth. God hates evil practices, and you can cross a line that he'll hate you. The Bible declares it in lots of places. The fact that it's not preached on is a sad thing. But we don't have to be in that camp. We do not have to be there. 
If you're here, I'm assuming that you're here because something in you longs for the Lord. And you know what? That pleases Him. All who call on the Lord, all should be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. He loves you. His Spirit is among us. He loves us. The question is not, does He love us? The question is, do we love Him? Are you in Psalm 8? O oh Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. You have set Your glory above the heavens. Where is this glory? From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foes of the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Where was his glory? It was in the heavens, but he also crowned man with it. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You are supposed to be crowned with that which is born in the heavens and rule the earth with the crown you receive from there. This is best exemplified in the life of Jesus because he's the living, breathing, walking... Scripture. But that does not mean that it's not supposed to be displayed in your life. You are a member of the body of Christ. This does not say that this would be the Messiah only. If you are in Christ, the substance of the glory of heaven is supposed to be adorning your head and you rule with that. Come on, friends. Let the world see the crown. Let them see the divine nature that God put in you. Let them see that it's the thing that you value the most in the world. You ever ask somebody for a few bucks or a quarter for a phone call or whatever? It used to be that people did that. Now, we're so very proud. What if we were not looking at people for what we could get from them? What if the only reason that you're making eye contact with somebody is because you hope to give them something? What if you really believe the standard for our life, which is that Bible that says it's more blessed to give than receive? When's the last time you walked up to a stranger and said, hey, can I pray for you? We'll borrow a cell phone. We'll ask for directions. But when is the last time you simply wanted to contribute something to the life of a person you didn't know because you thought it might be pleasing to God? See, these are the things we're supposed to live. We are supposed to rule the creation. Do you know why I can't help but say something to the men in line that are catcalling to the woman? I can't help it because I have something they need. You say, but you didn't pray for them with, and, and get, get them saved. Yeah, that was never my job. God called me to preach salvation. He called me to do the work of the kingdom. He never called me to declare people saved. That's not my job. That's his job. When their spirit inside them, when the Holy Ghost testifies with their spirit, they're sons of God, then they're sons of God. And it's beyond contestation. But it's not my job to give them the USDA stamp that makes them feel guilt-free. That's not my job. I won't do it for you. wouldn't do it for them. But you know what we do? Just by standing next to them and speaking good words, speaking of the love of God, they're reminded that there's a dividing line between those who dwell in the valley and those who have been taught to soar in a supernatural way. And they feel shame. We don't want anybody to feel shame anymore. And that's a shame. Because shame should drive you to the cross where your burden, where pilgrim's burden could be relieved. We sing the songs well, but we don't live it right. Our only witness is not to people saying, hey, you can be saved. Your witness might be, you may not be saved. And it might be that way because if there is still shame and guilt in their life, then they have not met the one who relieves it. Amen. Can I tell you a secret? I'm certain both of those men go to church. I'm certain they go to church because they show a certain respect for a pastor. The world is full of men who know the right things to do but are powerless to do it. You don't have to be like that. 
You got maybe one chance in your life to be a hero. Every day you have a chance not to be a coward. If we get filled with the presence of the living God, there's no limit to what you can accomplish. He called you to be crowned with His glory. Turn with me to 2 Timothy. Come on, somebody say, Pastor, give me a word I can live by. Here comes 2 Timothy. I love the books, the letters written to Timothy. He says things like, so you'll know how things ought to be in church. <laughs> they say before Leonard Ravenhill died, he held a conference call with pastors in Texas. And for the last several years, all they wanted to talk to him about was his prayer life and the letters written to Timothy. In 2 Timothy, the second chapter, read with me these words. They'll come from the third verse. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. Friends, if you're going to be a soldier... In the army of the Lord, which we sang about over and over and over, the Lord is rising up an army. You cannot get caught up in the lowly civilian affairs. Somebody said this to you on Facebook and you just had the need to respond and you embarrassed yourself before the whole world. Some relative did something ugly to you and you just had to do something ugly back because they're supposed to know better, forgetting you're supposed to know better as well. And we have become entangled in civilian affairs. We're supposed to please our commanding officer. Are you looking for a way each day to do that? Are you looking for a way each day to make Jesus smile with your life? If you've been taught you're just an old sinner and you can't do anything worthy of God, it is a lie. That's what we were. What we're becoming are the sons of God. And we're supposed to be praying for lives worthy of His kingdom. We're supposed to offer him fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. We're supposed to have a crown that is the soul winner's crown. The joy and pride on that day are those that you taught to love him like you love him. Last time Brother Richard was here, he preached, at least last time I was here and he was preaching, on evangelism. Every Christian ought to be involved in evangelism. Every Christian. It ought to be done with the smiles on our faces everywhere we go, every day, all day. Men who are on duty, filled with the presence of God, listening, tuning our ears to His command that we might move when He says move. Turn with me to Luke 12. We're going to wrap up here soon. The glory is in the heavens, but it's also a crown on your head. In Luke 12, we're told not to set our heart on some things. This comes from Luke 12, 27. Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? It sounds like Jesus is frustrated with those that are constantly worried about what they'll wear, what they'll eat, and how they'll make it. Doesn't that define most of our pursuit every day? What we'll wear, what we'll eat, and how we're going to make it. That preoccupation denies the fact that there's a God who has already ordered your footsteps. That preoccupation is the biggest statement of the lack of our faith that it could happen. Because the church of the living God says you could turn the sea into blood. You could have blood as high as the bridle on a horse's neck. You could have one worldwide ruler trying to kill us all and you cannot snuff out the fire that is in me. The faith of the church of the living God looks into the face of an antichrist spirit and says, do your worst and what's left will still bless him. The church began this way. Throw rocks at Stephen and what does he do? Forgives people and sees Jesus. Come on now, what are you doing when they throw rocks at you? Are you getting tangled up in their stinky mud? Are you learning to rise above it? 
Best way to learn to rise above it. You need to change your buoyancy, friends. We need to get more Holy Ghost in us than we got flesh in us, and it'll help you rise above it. Don't drink a little, drink a bunch. You know, the Bible says not to get drunk. Did you know that? It says don't get drunk on wine. It leads to excess. But be being filled with the Holy Ghost. You get filled with the Holy Ghost enough, you'll be as light on your feet as those drunks I saw on the dance floor. Cowards hiding in their sobriety and heroes with their liquid courage. But you know, the church is much the same way. In its sobriety, tracked, and only the intellectual realm, they sit in their seats silently. You get a few filled with the Holy Ghost, though, you'll venture out onto the dance floor of life, stop caring what everybody thinks, and just make a statement. Amen. I wish we had more dancing Christians. I grew up in a church that said Christians don't do that. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after such thing, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given you as well. What do we not set our hearts on? We don't want to set our hearts on the things the world does. The Bible tells us not, what not to set our hearts on, and it tells us what to set our hearts on. Guys, do you remember the time period where we had radios that did not have digital dials? Anybody in here over 30? Raise your hand if you ever had to actually turn a dial. You remember for televisions, my first television, to find the channel, I had to, to roll a dial. It was always discouraging with the radio and with TV how close the channel you wanted to watch was with all the ones you didn't want to watch. I don't have cable and I don't watch TV. But when we first got rid of cable, I was going through withdrawals and I was still trying to watch TV. And to find a channel where they were not speaking Spanish in Houston was difficult. And it's like that buried one English channel between 97 Spanish channels. And the degree of difference between what I needed to be set on and I could be edified by and what just didn't involve me much was just one little click. Sometimes in our heart, to set our heart on the things God wants versus the things He doesn't is the smallest degree of adjustment. But the further you go with Him, those little adjustments are everything. They really are. Guys, you get a few degrees off the direction you want to go and you go far enough and you are so far from where you wanted to be that you are lost while you thought you were on the right road. Turn with me to Colossians. Let's see what to set our hearts on. Say there when, I, when you're there. You'll be in Colossians 3. Try to get there. I admired those little flying fish. They didn't seem discouraged by it at all. They took flight. Come on, fish don't fly. All around you, the world will tell you what you can't do. In fact, that's the spirit of condemnation. Comes on you and says, you can't do this, you never will, you might as well give up now. But when the spirit of Christ comes on you, even in conviction, he says, you're better than this. You can go higher than this and further than this. Don't settle for less than this. If what you feel in the presence of God is a feeling that says you cannot succeed and you should just quit, that is your enemy. We call him the adversary and we've given him the proper name, Satan. If what you feel is, I was destined for something more than this. I'm not living up to it. I'm trapped in wickedness, but I know that there's more out there. That's the Spirit of God, and He will lead you into life. He did not come to crush you. He came for those who are already crushed, and He wants to put you back together. Amen. Anybody been a little ground up by the world? When nobody else can put you back together, the Spirit of the living God can. Remember, you already said it in here. You don't need money. The Bible's going to be the standard that you live by. You need your brothers, your brothers need you. You said those things out loud. The community of the living God joins hands and does the work of God. You know what the best cure for depression is while I'm on the subject? Get out and do something for somebody else. If you think hiding in your bedroom and reading a book is going to cure your depression, there's only one book that will do that, and it tells you to go to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I'd encourage you to not read it in private, to get out in a public place and read it. Maybe even somebody will ask you why you're doing it. 
And then you get to put into action what you've just practiced. Are you in Colossians 3? Colossians 3 verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. What have you been? Raised with Christ. Raised from the dead. Raised to a new standard of living. Raised to the right hand of God. You have been raised with Christ. Is Jesus depressed? Is Jesus frowning? Is Jesus having a bad day? Is Jesus not have what he needs? So, well, that's Jesus. The Bible that you said is the standard for your life says you have been raised with Christ. And so what do you have to do? Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. We have to adjust the center of our being So that what God set in the heavens, his glory, he said in Psalm 8, was set in the heavens, but he also wants it to crown men. What he set in the heavens, he's also willing to put on you. And you know what it requires? An adjustment of the center of your being. Now, if you were an Elvis fanatic, how would we know it? It Might show up in your hair, somebody said. Where else might it show up? I should get Matt to do it. I can't do it, you know. Where else might it show up? Might show up in your lips. Might show up in singing. Might, what was that thing he wore in Vegas, the big white thing? Leisure suit? Jumpsuit. Oh, look, somebody remembers. You kind of dug Elvis, didn't you? A whole generation did. It's okay. You can tell the truth. If he had hit the high mark of God in his life, he'd have been used of the Lord. Listen to the man sing Amazing Grace. It's not that he didn't know what it was. It's that he didn't walk in it. It made his mama really sad. His closest friends say that he would be sickened by what the world's done in their worship of him. Graceland's not really Graceland, friends. If you loved Elvis, it would show up because you'd be fascinated with the things Elvis did. You might even imitate the things that Elvis did. If you were filled with the spirit of Elvis... It would show up in a way in your life that made you distinct. How much more so if you're filled with the Spirit of God? It would mean that we walk like He walks. It would mean that we speak like He speaks. It means that we do the things that He does. Let's not say that I'm filled with the Spirit of God simply because I speak in tongues or I prophesy. Come on, talk about baby steps, friends. Being filled with the Spirit of God is when you become the witness to the entire world that the Spirit of God is. All of the rest is what we would call in Louisiana, lanyap. Just a little something extra to help you along the way. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Are you going to set your hearts today? Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. In the very center of you, you're going to make an adjustment to your spirit. You're going to say, my spirit is going to crave righteousness. It's going to crave Jesus. You're also going to make an adjustment in your soul, your mind, will, and emotions. When you get your spirit and your soul on the same page, your mind, will, and emotions in that core of who you are, you can make your flesh your slave. The problem is your mind, will, and emotions have been set on what your flesh desires and you've made your spirit a slave to your emotions and your flesh. So when they tell you it's raining, you have to be depressed, you're depressed. When they tell you you lost your job and the economy is going bad and you have to despair, you despair. But when your spirit is set on the things of God, when your mind has been adjusted on the things above, you declare to your flesh what it's going to do, how it's going to live, and the joy that you're going to take in it. You know, one person sees a budget and he sees restriction. Another lives in a budget and goes, I found such freedom. This is what I can spend. I knew I wouldn't get an amen on that one. The word of God is not restriction. It is freedom. It tells us what to be happy about, what to be angry about. It tells us how we should live. The problem is we've made it simply what we should know. Turn with me to 1 Peter. We'll probably close there. Say there when you're there. Throughout the scripture, there's an interesting thing about the gates of hell. I don't think I'll teach on it tonight. 
today, maybe tonight before we're done teaching, you never know. Actually, it was very strange for me to be away from everything. I, was, I preached last Sunday, and now we're Sunday again. So in that time frame, I didn't, I didn't do anything. You know how long it's been since I did not teach at least twice on a Sunday, at least once on a month? I'm usually teaching somewhere every night of the week. And something can happen to you when you do that. You can be so busy moving forward that you don't get a chance to look back and see all that God's done. Can I tell you, I am proud of what the Spirit of the Lord has accomplished. Eleven years ago, two of us stood in a living room, said the Lord will have a church here. We invited our neighbors who laughed at us and said no. Not just once, but for many weeks. We found a man who was addicted to crack. He could float sheetrock, and I couldn't. So he taught me to float sheetrock, and I taught him about Jesus, and we talked about freedom from addiction, and we labored together. As time went on, God began to add other people, and in covenant, our ministry began to grow. We outgrew a living room and then outgrew a garage, then outgrew a bigger house and a bigger garage, then outgrew one suite and then two, and then needed a new warehouse. And then we started with a few thousand square feet, and today there's 8,000 square feet. And we didn't do any of it. We were simply willing and obedient. And you're here today because God uses broken, ordinary people. While I was on the ship, I was looking at the water and how deep the water was. It's an amazing thing. 6,000 feet, 10,000 feet. That's a long ways. All of these scriptures began to come to me. I can't teach on them today, but that everything in the heavens, praise the Lord, everything on the earth and everything in the earth or under the earth in or under, shows up throughout the Bible. In Job 38, he speaks about the depths of the ocean and then says, do you know where the gates of hell are? It's an interesting question. It's 38, 17. You find it in Psalm 18, find it in 2 Samuel 22, David speaking about the torrents and waves of death that swirled about him and drug him down to the depths. And in the ancient world, they associated the gates of hell with the ocean. Then I saw these little fish and they're taking flight. They're flying straight out of what represented hell. And I seemed so happy to do it that when they hit the water, they went again. And did you see on that film? They would start to go back down towards hell. And they just wiggled their tail a little harder, flapped those little fins a little faster, and they were unwilling to be restrained by gravity. What if your spiritual life was like that? You simply refused to get into all of that, and you just wanted a little more time. You know what I bet it would look like? I bet you'd go from praise and worship to prayer and from prayer to praise and worship. You'd listen to teaching only to go put it into practice. You'd be skipping from mountain to mountain to mountain. And when you had to go down in the valley, you'd be encouraged because you had spent enough time on the mountain to know it was coming again. Come on, when you first fell in love with Jesus, were you one of those crazy people walk around with a tape recorder or a pen and pencil and a Bible everywhere you went? When did it become okay to leave that thing on the back dash of your car? We might need to renew. We might need to renew in here. Are you in 1 Peter? 1 Peter gives us a charge. Let us start in the 13th verse. Is that okay? Well, even if it weren't, we were going to do it anyway. So, therefore, you know what they say about therefore. You need to find out what they're there for. Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Christ Jesus is revealed. Come on, friends, what is motivating your life? Are you longing for his appearing because you know you have a crown of righteousness in store for you? Are you living your best life now and you're just happy to stay in all of the muck? I am longing for his appearing. I hope I beat you to him. And I hope that because he is the aim, the goal, the destination... He's everything to me. That's not a special class of people that become preachers. That's every Christian. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Guys, there is a father who's going to judge our work. That judgment ought to determine the way that we live. I want to please him. 
I've been told that fish don't fly. And if I'd asked you beforehand, hey, do fish fly? The answer is usually no until you see one do it. And then once you see it happen, a certain kind of smile comes over your face because you know that the assumption is no, fish don't fly. And yet you've seen one do something fish don't do. When you tell people you're a Christian, they've heard it so many times before, they don't believe it. If they do believe it, they believe you're the kind of Christian that can't fly. But let them see one that actually can. And a certain kind of smile will come over their face. And next time when they say all Christians are hypocrites, it'll be with a certain reservation because they think they may have met one that wasn't. That's how we're a witness to the world. Let us get filled with the Holy Ghost together. Can y'all stand and pray? Let's ask the mighty evangelist of God to come and magnify Jesus in our midst. We won't leave the building without praying for every person who needs to be healed to be healed because we believe in the kingdom of God. I didn't read it in Luke, but Luke 12 also says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for my Father delights in giving you the kingdom. I'm telling you, He delights in causing His kingdom to break out here as you're willing and obedient. So if you need healing, we're going to pray for you. We'll call for that. If you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost, you don't have to put off till later what you can have right now. We'll pray for that. If you've professed a love for Jesus all of your life, but your walk has never matched your profession, let's consider that you never really got born again. Oh, it's hard. It hurts. You have to swallow your pride a little bit. And yet that's where all life is. When you recognize what you don't have. You can't hang on to everything you have and have the pearl, friends. You either abandon everything and follow Jesus and it shows in your life, or you have to be honest with yourself right now and say, I never really did that. I said all of the right things and it never showed up in my life. We want to pray for you. Our whole heart's desire here is to see people walk in the high calling of God. This ministry is not supposed to settle on a few doing the work everybody else was designed to do. I really wish that all God's people were prophets. I really do. Some of you received words in here today that touched your heart. I could tell. You know, you don't have to have a pastor prophesy to you. You can prophesy to each other. You don't have to have a pastor pray for you. You can pray for each other. You don't have to do it only at church. You get to do it everywhere you go. The church is not this building. You are the church. You have relatives, don't go to church. Anybody got relatives, don't go to church. Bring church to them. You are the church. Show up there. Be like Christ among them. Let them see what it's about. Let them see fish fly. Might change the way they think about the world.